joining us in our morning worship service. It's our communion service this morning. We have a, a, a couple things going on. I think the pastor's going to show his face this morning, so I'm excited about that. Um, welcome to our church. Welcome those who are online this morning. Um, thank you for watching us. I hope you gain some benefits from our service. Um, I'm the announcement guy, so uh, our announcements are on the screen. Um, just to call your attention, today there's a deaf fellowship right after service. Um, thank you, our deaf constituency that are here, um, and many more will come. Uh, tomorrow is Awana at 6.30, and the theme night is um, wear a football jersey night. So I'm excited about that. Um, community group. Our Holy Spirit Bible study meets on first and third Tuesdays. And guess what? Tuesdays are first Tuesday. So we will have meeting. So please, for, uh, that's for those who attend. Please come at 11 o'clock in, uh, um, in the library. Our prayer is Wednesday morning, as always, at 8 o'clock. Everybody is welcome. Saturday is our woman's monthly Bible study, this coming Saturday. And next Sunday is our special pre-Valentine Day invite a friend service. So please consider inviting a neighbor, a friend, if you can have, I know nobody has enemies, but you can invite them too. Um, let's see, couples fellowship out, and remember that, that's at Bonanza. Uh, New Columbia, in New, New Columbia, PA, 6 p.m., um, and I think you need to let the pastor know and sign up for that so we know how many people are going. And the end of the month is our food fellowship. So are there any other announcements? All right, let's pray. Father, thank you for this day. Thank you that we could be here, that we can uh, worship you and as we worship you in spirit and truth, thank you for your word that guides us and teaches us and helps us along our way. Thank you for ministering to us today. We asked, I ask that your Holy Spirit would speak to hearts and minds so that we can be changed and be molded to serve you better and to know you better. Thank you for this opportunity to praise your name this morning. We give you the glory and honor. In Jesus' name, we all say, Amen. Amen. Worship team, you're on. Thank you, Paul. Good morning, Community Alliance. Let's try again. Good morning, Community Alliance. There you go. Thank you. Um, it feels kind of strange for me right now to be up here without my better half. As you can notice, Heather's not here this morning. She is in New York with my other daughter for a baby shower. Um, but uh, I decided that I don't want to be up here by myself, so I asked some friends to come and join me. So we have Jess singing vocals with me, and we have Jason on the electric guitar, and Ryan the drums back there. And so, uh, you know, I just thought that, you know, this is a time we want to worship God and praise Him, and we want to give Him the best we can. And so I thought that for me, I love music, and the best way I can praise him is with music and getting my friends to join me here um, this morning. I want to start off with a scripture verse for you guys. It comes from Psalms 100, 1 through 5. Shout for the Lord, shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. And it is he who made us. And we are his. We are his people, the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and courts with praise. Give thanks to him and praise his name. For the Lord is good. And his love endures forever. His faithfulness continues throughout all generations. And so this is a reminder to me and to us, why we worship God. He's not just our creator. He's not just the mighty God. 
But he has shown his amazing love to us by sacrificing his son on the cross. And that's one of the things we're doing today is communion service to remember the suffering that Jesus did on our behalf. It's not something we deserved, but he gave it to us out of his love for us. And it didn't stop there. Through that sacrifice he made on the cross, he gave us eternal life with him. And he also gave us the hope that we need in this world. And we've seen lately what this world has become and what is it going through. But through that darkness comes the light. And that's God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And so I don't know what you guys are going through right now, what's on your mind, what's distracting you, what's discouraging you. But it's times like this is when we worship God. Because when we worship God, even those difficult times in our lives, we remind ourselves of who God is and who God can, what God can do. And we remind ourselves that God is our hope. He is our encouragement. He is our comfort. And when we take that action where we praise him, we feel him ministering to us. So would you please join me as we stand and worship the God.
Father God, we do give you the glory, Father, because you are worthy of it. You are the mighty God. You have overcame death. You have overcame sin in our lives. And you have given us a relationship with you again. You have helped us through the difficult times in our lives. And you are there to give us comfort. We thank you, Lord, for who you are. We thank you, Father, that you came down here and wanted this relationship with us. And Father, I pray that your spirit will move in this place, will move in our hearts, so we may worship you in Jesus' name. Amen. before you humbled by what you have done in our lives and we pray father god now as pastor jay comes up to speak that you would just prepare our hearts father to receive your words take away any distractions that we may have take away any pain any fear any anxiety 
help us to put it at the foot of the cross. I pray, Father, your spirit would just move in this place, will move through Pastor Jay, that your words will come out and change our lives. Father, we give you this time, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. You may all have a seat. Amen. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. What an awesome prayer that, um, that, uh, that, that His name would be glorified amidst us. What an awesome song, right? That here we are to worship and here we are to bow down. And here we are to say that you are my God. That's my prayer for us today, that He's not just God. Not that just that He is the God, but that He is your God and our God as individuals, and then as, as a body of believers. Amen? Uh, what an awesome day. God is faithful. Let me just um, say a few things here. First of all, if you're here for the first time, if you're visiting us for the first time, if you, or if it's been a first time in, you know, 89, 90 years or something, a long time, uh, and you're here, we have a gift for you. It's your first time here or your first time in a long time. Just raise your hand. Just want to make sure I saw a few new faces uh, uh, yeah, I know you 400 years. You can put your hand on. I already know you. All right. So praise God for that. All right. Um, so uh, I don't know if you all received a faith promise card. Um, they were handed out before. Just that's something to take home and pray about. You know, you know, we are the Christian Missionary Alliance Church, and we support missions throughout the world. And there's some good things going on around the world. So you'll get to hear more about that as the year goes on. But nonetheless, that's a promise you take to the Lord, whether it's a dollar a month or a quarter a month or more than that. God knows it's a commitment between you and Him. We also encourage that for the children. I want you to notice that there is a flyer in your bulletin, a reminder that this coming Sunday is our annual Invite a Friend to Church service. So we want to encourage you to be in prayer about that. I'll send another one. I'll email another one out this week. But I pray about a neighbor, a friend, a family member, someone that you can invite to church uh, next Sunday. As far as the couples outing, it's going well. We have 16 people coming so far, so eight couples. We're hoping for more. So again, I need to know. We did send out that invite uh, thing on the email. Uh, If you plan on going, let us know. If you plan on, if you can't make it as well, let us know. But uh, so that we know that uh, we have a good group and I need to call them as soon as I know a number to let them know. That's not me. Okay, same one I have. Uh, so let me know, please. We can pray about that, and we're going to have a great, great time for that couple's outing. All right, as you know, today is a communion service. So on communion Sunday, we did it all of that last year. The elders and I, the leaders of I, and myself have done it for a few years now. But on communion Sunday, we take time to fast through breakfast. Uh, and then I give some prayer requests that I sent we're praying for this month. Last month, we didn't get to pray together because of the snow cancellation. So we're praying for the same things. Some of the things that we are fasting and praying for uh, is, number one, a God-initiated spiritual desire and conviction for something more in 2024. That doesn't come from me. It doesn't come from ourselves. It comes from Him working by His Spirit in our hearts and and just nudging us uh, for a sense of something more. Right? When we're hungry, we have this sense of the desire to go get something to eat. When we're hungry for God, we have this sense and desire to to get closer. And so be in prayer about that. A God initiated spiritual desire and conviction for something more in 24. A discipleship mindset and passion and pursuit, especially this year, a mindset of perspective on discipleship, making disciples, being disciples, followers of Jesus, and a passion and pursuit for that. Our children youth and youth ministry. Keep them in prayer. Our children, the youth and the youth ministry. Uh, Our finances for ministry needs and repairs. Pray for that. Uh, Let me get back to the children and youth ministry. Just do pray right now. We are not sure we're going to have the the VBS this year. We're hoping, I'm hoping and praying because I know God wants to do something, but we need people. Uh, We don't have uh, people right now. So just praying that for how God can use you to be a part of the VBS ministry. And uh, continue to pray for the Awana ministry and our youth ministry. Uh, Our finances for ministry needs and repairs. And lastly, a gracious and spiritual intervention for the war in the 
the heartless killings to come to an end. And we need, we know, we know that um, um, the weapons of our warfare and our con over there, mighty through God to the pulling down of strongholds. And so we need to pray this spiritual intervention. What we need is a spiritual visitation intervention through the people of God, through His Spirit, uh, to bring an end to what's going on in our world. And we know that it's going to require a lot of prayer and a lot of wisdom and spiritual guidance on the part of God's people. So I want us to take a moment, just bow your heads and take a moment to pray about any of those things I mentioned. And God initiated spiritual design, conviction for something more, discipleship mindset, our children and youth, our finances, and for the war to come to an end. So take a couple of moments and talk to the Lord about that. Father, we bless you and we praise you this morning that uh, um, you know all circumstances and, uh, and that you are God Almighty and that there's nothing that you cannot do, God. You created the world. You created man from the dust of the ground. Uh, there's nothing, absolutely nothing impossible for you. So, God, when we pray these things, though they seem impossible for us, how in the world is it going to happen? Help us to see that you're bigger than the problems and the challenges and to trust that you can if you will. And so we pray for these concerns. We leave them before you in the name of Jesus. Father, whether it's the children's ministry or the youth. Uh, Father, if it's the finances of our church, Father. And the repairs that need to be made, Father. If it's a, a mindset which Jesus, you speak to us and spoke to us about. And will some more on discipleship. If it's that mindset that we need to have personally, individually, and corporately as a church, as a people. Father, we just pray that you would do your work in all of these requests that we've been fasting and praying for. We thank you and we bless you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Let me just uh, get something over here. Oh, Caleb? Hey. You okay? Oh, yeah. You know I got to preach? Well, I'll just sit here and watch what in the world you're doing. Okay. You Stop remind me of Paul here. sometimes. Hey, hey guys. Hey, how are you? Oh, good. Good. How are you? Hey. I just, I just wanted to tell you guys, um, just be careful with, uh, with things that you do in life. You know, like uh, there's so many things that we can do that are bad choices. There's, uh, you know, not honest decisions that we can make, taking shortcuts. Uh, I, just, I just felt like I had to tell you guys that. I, uh, I don't know. Have, have you guys ever, like, received a, a, a gift think so no. oh well no. what about have you ever received like a, a stolen gift a stolen I, gift I, unless I, you I, have i have uh, not maybe yeah <laughs> uh, uh, how, how would how would you feel if you received a, a, a stolen gift are, are they letting me know it's stolen or are they just giving it to me yeah, and you, you found out later i wouldn't feel too happy that somebody wasn't honest with me yeah, well, I, I tried to take a shortcut one year. I tried to uh, make a, not an honest decision. I stole all my family's Christmas presents and, and gave, them, gave them all their presents that year, and I felt pretty good. I felt like I, I got them nice stuff that they would have wanted, but I stole everything. And uh, come to find out after, I did not feel too good. The results of that was me worrying Oh, what if they're caught out in public wearing this stuff, yeah. this stolen stuff, and it's because of me that I stole it. How did they feel when you told them it was stolen? Well, 
they, uh, they wish they would have, wouldn't have gotten it. They, would, they did not want the presents after. <laughs> so it wasn't a gift then. So I just, I just want to encourage you guys to just make the right choices, be honest, and don't take shortcuts. And please try to tell other people about this so that they don't do the same thing. Yes, yes. Thank you so much for this right. advice. Yes. Thank you. Sad Thank story. You. Thank you. Try not to steal any more gifts. All right. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Never know what happens here. I'll tell you. Here, come on up. <clears throat> Chris! Hey, let me talk to you. Put the cell phone away a second. Good. Good seeing you. I'm, I haven't seen you for at least a couple seconds. Wow, I'm glad I ran into you today. I have an investment for you. Yes, I know, I, I know your heart. I know you like investments. But I want to help you make money quick and fast, okay? It's, it's awesome. I've been perfecting this program for years. It's called Paul's Ponzi um, perfect investment scheme and it works awesome and here's the deal here's the deal um, you don't have to you don't have to do a lot but you have to do a couple things okay first of all some of the things I do might be a little under the table okay now I have a an accountant that does things under the table so that 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 helps, that helps us make more money faster, okay? It, it's great. She's awesome to work with. And then I, I have an appliance guy that I get appliances, real inexpensive, and we sell them at, at retail price, make money fast. There's a, there's a guy that works at a mulch place. I get precious stones. It's awesome. And then we resell, you make money quick and fast. But there's one catch. You have to follow me, watch how I do things, and learn from me as an example, and then you too will be successful like I am. And I have a good reputation. Just ask my church family. I have a great reputation out there, but you got to follow me in all my ways, and you will make money quick and fast. Is that awesome? Are you ready? Yes. Thank you, Pastor. Can, all I can say to that is do not invite Caleb to your home <laughs> unless you have a camera that's watching him. And pray for Patty. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. Pray for Patty. She needs it. Uh, you notice that how they, they, they both intended to endorse a, a teaching or a belief or a scam that they had. Well, at least that poor was. Uh, in, in, in order to help, to, wanting them to join them, to be a part of what they're doing or what they believe in or to what, what they endorse. Um, so a disciple, a disciple is someone who accepts and therefore spreads the message or spreads the teachings or the doctrines or the beliefs of another. It, 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 it's like, you know, someone teaching the doctrines of, of Charles Rutherford, right, the JWs. Or Joseph Smith, the, the, the Mormonism, or the teachings of Karl Marx, Marxism, or, or Sigmund Freud, you know, psychoanalysis, or, or even the teachings of Charles Darwin, right? The, the one who came up with the whole idea of evolution, you know, just following and teaching. Or how about the teachings of Jim Jones, who in 1978, he, um, he led 909 people to... To, it was, it was a, a mass suicide. They didn't find one Bible in that event. And I think this happened in Guyana. I think, was it Guyana? Yeah. And uh, imagine that. And, you know, 909 people drank the Kool-Aid. They followed his advice. So there are also disciples of gang leaders and they're disciples of Satan. Uh, in other words, there, there are disciples who, who endorse something that is good. And, and then there are disciples who endorse things that are not so good. And then there are disciples of Jesus. 
who 2,000 years ago came into this world, uh, gave his life and rose from the dead, and then he left a message for the generations to come, a message to bring. And church, I need to say this morning that um, Jesus is still touching lives. He is still changing lives. He is still using lives to spread his message and it is still being shared. It is still happening. And lives are being changed for His glory. Amen? That's, that's a hallelujah if you ever had, heard one. Because His message that He left for us to share is still being used today. And is still having the same impact it had over 2,000 years ago. And some of us here today, Paul be a good example, are still vibrantly excited about Jesus. Amen? Amen. So today, with, in keeping with our memory verse for the first two months of, Jan, of Jan, January and February, the first two months of 2024, and for the, the year as a whole, today I want us to look at these verses, and uh, these two verses, and, and see what it is that Jesus is saying to us when it comes to discipleship, because we know that, that um, he left this message that is still being proclaimed, that we live for, that we gather for on Sunday mornings, and therefore, we want to we investigate, all right? We want to investigate a bit of what he is saying to us this morning regarding that. So I want us to notice upon the screen, this is our memory verse uh, for the month, for the, the rest of this month and the, all of this year. Therefore, Jesus says up on the screen, Matthew 28, 19 and 20, he says, Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. And surely, he says, I am with you always. What a powerful, powerful thought from Jesus. We'll consider this this morning. I notice up on the screen, uh, the title of our message for today is God's Blueprint for Discipleship. We'll be hearing about discipleship throughout this year here and there. Uh, and, and there's some obstacles to discipleship. To this. So there's the spiritual warfare aspect and the need for discipleship. So there's the revival aspect. So we're not going to get away from those two subjects. Amen? No amen on that one? Amen. Amen. So please stand with me and join me in prayer. Let's seek his face this morning. And if you would say, Pastor, would you pray for me? I'm not even looking, but the Spirit of the Lord is. Would you pray for me? I just... Um, I, I'm having a hard time staying focused today. Pray that I'd stay alert. Pray, pray that I'd hear God. Pray that I'd receive from Him. Pray that if there's a message from Him to me today, that I would hear it and that nothing would interfere with that. Just raise your hand for a moment and slip it right back down. Spirit of God, we bless you and praise you this morning for your presence. Thank you that we can freely sing songs to you and that those songs not just externally, verbally, but internally. We can rejoice in the presence of Christ in our lives and sing songs unto you even while working or driving our vehicles. Father, we know that you're there with us, so thank you for the songs. But Father, this morning we invite you, Spirit of God, to guide. I commit to you every heart, every person, every woman, every man, every child, every person, every believer, every follower, every person that you've brought into this building this morning. And then for those that are hearing us online, oh God, in the name of Jesus, Holy Spirit of God, your word says that we can only hear as you, as you do your work in our hearts and in our minds. And so we pray, Spirit of God, for you to quicken our ears and soften our hearts and prepare our minds for your word this morning, dear Jesus, we thank you. We invite you, Spirit of the Lord, to have your way this day. In Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> so let's inspect, right, this famous, this is a famous statement of Jesus. It is also the very last commandment or the last mission that he leads for us in the Gospel of Matthew. It is also known as the Great Commission. Very powerful phrase that Jesus gives. But first, let me give you a quick necessary content as to what is going on in Matthew 28. Okay? So, um, Jesus was crucified and he's in the grave. And two women decide to go to the tomb to see Jesus. And when they get there, what happens is that there immediately appears before them an angel. And they're startled. And the angel basically tells them, don't be afraid. He says that Jesus you're coming to see is no longer here. He has risen as he told you he would. And as the scriptures declared prophetically that he would rise from the dead. And then they say to them, go now 
to the disciples and tell them that if they want to see Jesus for themselves, they can go to Galilee and there they will see him for themselves. And so the ladies, these two ladies, feverishly rush to tell the disciples. And then in verses 16 and 17, um, it says that the disciples, when they saw Jesus, they worshipped him. But some of them doubted. Let me say this. When Jesus calls us into his work, he doesn't call doubters. In fact, it's believing in him and recognizing him and reaching out to him that gives us the faith to know that he's alive and real and that he's all that he is. So perhaps they doubted because he had just recently risen from the dead or they, they doubted because maybe, I mean, would we, if we saw him dead one day and the next day he's alive, maybe they doubted, wondered, is he really alive or is this a phantom? Perhaps they had a reason to doubt. Maybe not, because he already told them that he would rise from the dead. And so did the Tanakh in, Matt, in uh, Psalm 16 and, and verse 10, that God would not allow his Holy One to see decay. The prophecy of the resurrection is in the Tanakh. And so Jesus, so the they disciples go, they see him, and they worship him, some doubt. And then in verse 18, Jesus declares that all authority in heaven Please hear this. If we're going to understand what discipleship is, not just what it is for us, but what it is through us, uh, Jesus says to the disciples, when they see he's alive, that he conquered that, he says, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. All authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. To me. So Jesus always had authority. He always had all authority. But now following his death and resurrection, now he has the authority to give or, or to offer and to give eternal life. Because he conquered death. He conquered the issue of sin and separation from God. So he has this authority now to give the gift of eternal life to those who would recognize who he is and put their trust in Him. All authority has been given unto me, He says. So the word authority in, 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 the, in the Greek is the word exousia, and it means to have given, has, have control and dominion over everything. It's to have a delegated authority to control all the spheres of life. That's who He is. That's who He's claiming that He is. So let me ask you a question. From that verse alone, verse 18 that is not on the screen, um, how much authority does Jesus have? It says all authority. In other words, there's no more authority to be given outside of Jesus. So let me ask you this question. If Jesus has all authority, how much authority does the devil have? The devil has zero authority. Zero authority, especially over the people of God who have put their faith in Him. That means that if you're a child of God today, there is no spiritual attack by the enemy that can come against you that has authority to defeat you, overtake you, unless we give the devil the right to do that. We are more than conquerors in Christ. We have authority to, to trample on snakes and scorpions and to overcome all the power of the enemy, all the power of the enemy, complete power over the enemy, unless we don't believe the text and believe the lie. And so Jesus says to them, I've got all authority. He has all authority. So one day, everybody, every person, our enemies, our friends, or atheists, or agnostics, Everybody will one day bow before Jesus and say that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. The sad thing is that some, for some, it will be too late. But it says that in Philippians 2 and verse 9, 10, and 11, that it actually says that God exalted him above every name and gave him the name that is of every name. And that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. Every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Every, unfortunately, for some, it will be too late. They'll be doing it, but after that declaration, they go to where they've chosen to go to that disregarded God. 
And so uh, the blueprint for discipleship begins with knowing who it is that is calling us to disciple. Who is he? He has all authority over everything and anything. In the name of Jesus, we have reason to consider these verses. So I want you to notice in Matthew 28, 19 and 19, 20. These are our verse. These are the two memory verses for this new year. Matthew 28, 19. Therefore, Jesus says, go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost baptizing them in the name of the Trinity. So after declaring, after declaring that he, is, he has all authority, think about this, after he makes it clear to the disciples that he has all authority, that he has dominion, that he has power, that is his, that belongs to him, that's who he is, after declaring them, he, that he says to them, therefore, it's like you going to a job, you just got that job, you've never met your high boss you met the people who interviewed you, and you go there, and you don't know who's this guy, who's this guy, who's that guy, and you say hello to everyone, but all of a sudden, one comes to you and says, my name is John Smith. I'm the one who signs your check. Jesus says, therefore, in other words, because of what I just said, that I have all authority because of that, therefore, that means Therefore, that you there need to listen for what I've just said. Why? Because it is him, Jesus, the one with all authority, who makes this claim of who he is. Now, before we go into this, this verse, let me just say that there are two possibilities here. Because he says, therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. Therefore, go and make disciples. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations. There's got to be one of two things going on here. Number one, either these people that he's calling us to disciple are people who have already given their hearts and lives to Jesus. They have had some kind of a spiritual conversion experience. Or, or they are people that he is calling us to impact in a positive way to make them curious and hungry for the things of Jesus so that they themselves would find Christ. You see, the idea of conversion doesn't belong to us. You and I do not have the ability to lead people to Christ. That's the job of the Holy Spirit in 1 Corinthians 12 and verse 3. See, the Holy Spirit is the only one that can go. It is an internal. Conversion is an internal thing where the Spirit of God begins to move in the heart of man. There's got to be a spiritual baptism before a physical baptism. In other words, there has to be an internal cleansing of the heart of man and women, an internal cleansing. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things. There's got to be an internal cleansing of the heart. Ezekiel 36, 25 and 26, where God says, and I will give you a clean heart and I'll put a new spirit within you. He begins to change the heart. I can't do that. There's no theologian in this world, whoever was, ever will be, who can change someone's heart. That's the Holy Spirit's job. And so the disciples he's talking about here are either those who were discipled, who are baby Christians and now to be need to be nurtured, or those that we are going to impact in a way to draw them to Jesus. But that's the, that, that's, that's the spiritual baptism that can only be done by the Spirit of God. Romans 6 and verse 3 talks about that, where it says that we have been baptized into the body of Christ. Baptized into his death. That is a spiritual work of the Spirit of the Lord. We cannot do that. The Holy Spirit does that. But that is the spiritual baptism that must happen before the physical baptism. So, so, so whether they're converted and now Jesus is calling us to help them become strong, vibrant Christians, discipling them, or whether they are not converted, and God is bringing them into your life and to my life so that we can influence them and make them hungry and make them thirsty for Jesus. That's a powerful, powerful thing. Can I tell you a testimony? 
So I went to this restaurant where my neighbor lives at, and some of you know that we've been praying for them. They're Muslims. We've actually done work in their shop, not wanting any money just to be a testimony. I just felt we were like, like missionaries, Eileen and I. They're making food in a Muslim restaurant uh, for Jesus. And so we go there, see them every other, every other week, and hang out with them in their restaurant. And so the other day, he comes up to me, um, a strong Muslim, and he says to me, hey, I need to talk to you. You see, they have a worker in the back who is, he, he, he speaks the Hindi language. Uh, and he told me, I have a guy in the back that is interested in Christianity. And I told him that you're a pastor and that you know Jesus and that you can help him find Jesus. My neighbor, who's a Muslim, is evangelizing for Christ. Unbelievable, the things that God can do. And so pray for him. Uh, just pray for this ministry and this opportunity God's given us. We're looking to buy him a Bible, and I'm looking to contact some people who speak his, his, his language. So we're, 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 we're called to disciple people that have either just come to Christ and need to be strengthened in their faith, or who God's using us to point to Jesus. 1 Peter 2.12 says that we're to live lives that cause people to realize that there's a Christ. Mark Matthew 5.19, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and, and, and praise your Father in heaven. So our lives can make men and women hungry for Jesus. Our lives can cause people. Have you ever, anyone in here, just raise your hand, that it was the impact of a person that caused you to want to know about Jesus? Anybody? Amen? It was the impact of people. And that's what God, that's another way, another form of discipleship, just being a light and pointing people to Jesus. And I want you to notice here, however, that, <laughs> that it says, Jesus says, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Holy Spirit. And so, so let me just say that, you know, the spiritual baptism has already happened, right? That's why we need to baptize them physically. The spiritual baptism has occurred. And now Jesus talks about spiritually baptized, physically baptizing them, which is basically is following Jesus into the waters of baptism. It's a, it's a physical demonstration of what happened spiritually so that people can see the confirmation of your commitment to follow Jesus into the waters of baptism. But it's interesting that the same presence of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, notice it says, he says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. He's not saying in the names, but the name. And that same presence was there with Jesus in Matthew chapter 3, verses 16 and 17. The same presence of the Trinity was there. Now, I want you to know that the whole idea of the Trinity um, was the very, is found very first verse in the entire Bible. You know that? It says, in the, beginning, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. That's the first verse of the Bible. The Hebrew word there for God is the word Elohim. And the word Elohim is the plural form of the word God. Literally, in Hebrew, it says, God's, God's created the heavens and the earth. That's what it says in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. Now, if, if, if there was no other word for God in the Hebrew, then the, the opposers of the Trinitarian teaching would have an argument. But there is a word singular for the word God, and it's, it, and it's El Eloah. Why would the Holy Spirit want the verse to say God's instead of God? Well, because all three of them were there at the creation. They were all there. One God, three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, let us make men in our image, say the Scriptures. And so it's important to understand that Jesus meant what he said when he said, in the name of the Father, the Father who created us, of the Son, the Son who went to the cross, of the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit who lives in our hearts to empower us and to guide us and direct us on how to live the Christian life. Matthew 28, 19. Let's look at the verse 20. It says, and teaching them, Jesus says, so he says, make disciples of all nations, baptize, disciples, they're, they're spiritually saved now, they're spiritually baptized, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit, and then teaching them, he says, to obey everything I have commanded, and surely I am with you always to the very end of the age. 
So, um, so church, let, let me say that evangelism is, is, is just not, is, is not just the commission. It's not just commissioning people. It's not, it's, 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 oh, it goes a step further. It goes even further than that. Eva um, discipleship involves, evangelism is bringing them the word. Discipleship involves taking them by the hand and teaching them how to take their first steps in Christ. Jesus says, don't just, don't just baptize us. Teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. And so we're not, we're not just, we're not just teaching them God's word. It's not just a, we're not just giving them biblical principles. We're also teaching them how to obey the scriptures. We're teaching them how to honor God. We're teaching them how to fight temptation. We're teaching them the reality of temptation to obey. It's not just, hey, now you're born again. God bless you. Have a great day. Have a wonderful day. Have a good life. I'll be praying for you. No, he says teach them to obey the word. Baptize them. Teach them. Teach them what temptation is. Teach them what falling into sin is. Teach them what it is to dishonor God. And listen, it's not just teaching them the word. It's also showing them the word by how we live. Yeah, ch church, the way that you and I live our lives in itself is a testimony. It's, a, it's discipling people. I don't know how many of you understand this, but there are people in our church right now who are watching us. They watch how we live. They hear how we pray. They, 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 they watch how we deal with conflict and how we treat people. They listen to the words we speak. They listen to, or they watch how we react when stress and pressure comes upon us. That's a form of discipleship. There are various forms of discipleship, but it basically believe, begins by taking someone under your wing and helping him or helping her know what it is to know and follow Jesus. So let me share with you the scriptures. Let me show what Jesus said. Let me show you what he did. But let me also show you what it means to obey him. Because we're no longer the king of our domain. We're no longer sitting on the throne of our hearts. We've invited Jesus to take that place. So he is Lord. He is the king. He's the one that leads us. I had one girl come up to me one day. A, a young teenage Christian came up to, to me and said, You know, um, I'm very surprised and I'm very confused when I'm around such and such uh, a person who is a Christian. Uh, she says, because this person uh, tells me what I'm supposed to do, but then she turns around and does what she's telling me that I'm not supposed to do. Now, I'm going to be, I'm, I'm, let, let's be fair, let's be honest here, right? Because I, I know that there are times when, when we've offered discipleship. I'm not just about this church. I'm talking about every church I've been in, where the offer is made. Listen, you came to Christ. You received Jesus. Now I want to help you learn how to be a follower of Jesus. I bet ev I trust every hand in here would go up if I asked you this morning, would you want to become a better follower of Jesus? I trust every hand would go up. And if yours doesn't go up, mine will go up for you and for myself at the same time because I need to... We've not attained. Paul says, I've not, I've not attained. I've not finished. There's a race to be run here. And so um, we've had times when we've sat with someone and, and attempted to disciple them, and they rejected. They didn't cooperate. They didn't want to do it. They didn't have the time. They didn't, and it almost want you to be, gets you to a point where you wonder, was the commitment serious in the heart? And so there's not much you can do there. The enemy takes that life and ruins it and makes everybody think that they're not really born again if they are. So there's a time for that. You know, discipleship is the disciple, the one who disciples, but it's also the one to be the disciple who needs, it needs to be working both ways. You need to be desired to grow in Christ and you need to desire to help others grow in Christ as well. So there is a great difference between a person who, a student who has to learn. There's a difference between a student who has to learn and a student who wants to learn and is looking to learn. There's a big difference there. One has to learn. Few, he's being forced and, ah, I don't want to do it, but here I am. And there's, there's the one who wants it. I sat with someone just recently and I said to him, hey, I want to I wanna spend some time taking through, you through a discipleship book. But we're going to go to the second level, not the first, because I, I feel you're a bit of an advantage. You know what he told me? He said, no, I want to start at the lowest level and work my way up because there's so much to learn. Wow. <laughs> That's what I want to hear. 
Yeah, he wants to start right from the bottom. Even though it might be review some of it, he wants to, to work on the foundational aspect of his walk with Jesus and what it all, all means. And so nonetheless, a discipleship involves pointing someone to Jesus. It involves helping them understand what it is to be a follower. It helps them understand uh, what it is to know Christ. It helps them grow and, and builds them up in their faith to Jesus. How to follow Christ, how to be like Christ, how to live like Christ, how to think like Christ, how to point Christ to other people. That's discipleship. That's growing. How to overcome temptation. That's discipleship. See, um, the whole idea of accountability begins first that we are accountable to God. We are accountable to this book. But then we are also to be accountable to each other. We are to be accountable to each other where you have someone under, that, that takes you under his or her wings, men with men, women with women, that you can open up and be honest with regarding struggles in your life that the enemy continues to use to bring you down and struggle on the ground. And so I want to encourage you regarding that. Um, disciples are not, they're not informed, they are formed. They are made by men and women who take them under their wings, who know how to follow Jesus, who are growing in themselves and following Jesus and want to help others do the same. Do we need that in our church? Does the church of Jesus need that today? Men and women growing, encountering Jesus, not just saying, well, I'm a Christian, I prayed, I received Jesus. But they are actually on a day-by-day -day basis learning to take the footsteps of Jesus. Olive is running around. You saw her the other day, Olive is running around already. That's so fast, right? And, you know, these kids, how they learn how to walk. Mom taught them. Dad held a hand and walked and helped them walk and go easy. And when they fell, they picked them up. But that's what happens with young Christians. They need to be taught how to walk. They will fall. They will stumble. And we need to be patient. But they need to be willing to lift up their hands and trust in the hand of the one who's discipling them as well. Amen. So I want you to notice also that Jesus says to them here in this verse, he says, and I will be with you always, even until the end of the age. I will be with you always. So the whole idea of discipleship, of evangelizing, of bringing the message of Jesus to others involves Jesus. He said he's there with you. And I know a bunch of us would say, I'm, I'm nervous when sharing the gospel. I don't know what to say or how to say it. And the more we say that, the more we're not going to tell someone about Jesus. The more we listen to that voice, I tell you, it's not the Spirit of God saying, you don't know what to say. You're going to fail. You're going to mess up. Is that God? No, because then he would contradict Matthew 28, 20. The voice you're going to hear is, I am with you always. I will give you the words. See, when we trust Jesus to be our evangelist token into people's lives, um, he not only works through us, but he also works in the hearts of those that we're talking with. He gives us the words. I've had people say to me, I didn't know what in the world I said to them, but it worked. Of course you didn't, because you didn't plan it. We don't plan those things. And so Jesus is the one that is there with you. He's with, there with you all the time. He will work through you. So notice again God's blueprint for today. I wanted to read something as I close this brief message here, because it is Communion Sunday, and we want to take a few moments, not much for testimonies today. But I wanted to read this to you. It's called, Say, say Mr. Be Ye Jesus. A train was pulling into the depot. On the platform stood a very small crippled body. His basket was filled with fruit and nuts to sell to the passengers. The train had not yet come to a full stop. When a businessman had swung himself from the train and in his hectic collided and in his haste collided with the boy on the platform, the basket was overturned and its constants scattered. The man saw what had happened, but as the crippled boy, um, the fruit boy, crippled boy, was the only one concerned, and as the man was in a hurry, he walked away toward the city without saying a word. Just then the train stopped and traveling, a traveling man alighted. He too had important business in the city, but he was a boy that was in trouble. The traveling man comprehended the situation in a glance, the scattered fruit, the crippled boy, the distress on his face, and the tears in his eyes. The man said nothing 
but set down his bag and quietly but rapidly assisted the boy to gather and replace in the basket the fruit and the packages which could be rescued from amid the hurrying feet. The task was completed and the traveler was about to leave when he reached into his pocket to leave. He reached into his pocket and taking out a silver dollar, he placed it on the top of the basket. As he did so, the boy looked up through tears into the face of the man and said, Say, Mr. Be ye Jesus? No, said the man. I'm not Jesus, but I'm one of his followers. And as I go about, I try to do the things which I think he would do if he were here. Be ye Jesus. I truly believe that every single one of us is a disciple in one way or another. We, we, we all have something that, something that we want to teach or something we learned or someone we follow. We all do. The question is, who are you a disciple of? See, a disciple of Jesus has Jesus living in his heart. He has a heart for Jesus. He, he seeks to know Jesus. He seeks to encounter Jesus. He seeks to follow Jesus. He seeks to, to do the things Jesus does. But he also seeks to share Jesus with others and to help them do the same. <clears throat> God has called us to be a life for Jesus. 2,000 years ago, it's still working. We're disciples today because someone took time with us. And there are many young baby disciples today who need to be taught how to live the Christian life. We need to make them Longing for that. The Holy Spirit can do that as well. I'm going to close in prayer. Uh, I give out this out periodically. These are little cards. Because of our calling and our purpose and the Great Commission over 2,000 years now, um, conversations you have with people, someone at the supermarket line, someone crying the blues at your job because the husband is filing for divorce or because the son has a lump in his chest and no one knows what it is. Someone who has a hard time uh, with someone at his work, someone whose marriage is messed up, whose relationship with his children are not well, or who is surrounded by lost people at work who if they die today would go to hell. Um, just opportunities God might give us to pray for someone or to tell someone about Jesus or to give them a card. A join us card at our church. Join us for a Sunday service, and we'll have someone there to pray with you or to teach you about Jesus. He is the hope of our world. So if anyone wants some of these, I've got packets of five. Just raise your hand. You put it in your wallet. Put it in your purse. And as God opens those mighty doors, you just uh, thank you. Those are things to pray about. Give that to Those doors are opened all the time. They open often in the restaurants if you have a conversation with your waitress or whoever's taking care of you. They open often. Notice the name on their, their tag. If it's a Bible name, jump on that one, buddy. Talk to them about Jesus. But there's so much hurt and so much pain in our world, isn't there? There's so much, there's so much distrust. There's so much uncertainty. There's so much anxiety. There is so much fear in our world. People are waiting for the right answers because they're not getting it from the tube on TV, from the Internet. They're not getting it. That's where you and I come in. Amen? Would you pray with me? I just want to ask if, if there's anyone who, you know, there's a person in your life God's brought there for you to be a light for, that the light of Jesus would shine through you at your work, at your home. Sometimes they live in our own house in your community, at your workplace, there's someone you know that God wants to use you to be a light to. Go out into all the world and make disciples of men, teaching them, baptizing them, to obey everything I've commanded, and I will be with you always. If there's anyone, just raise your hand. I pray for you. Spirit of God sees the hand. Someone you need prayer for, for a relationship with someone that you know God's called you to be a light for. Just raise your hand. Amen. Anybody else? Amen. Amen. Praise God. God knows who they are. And 
And what is awesome is that he went to the cross and was nailed to that cross with a crown of thorns on his head for that person whose hand you, who you just raised your hand for. So, Father, we thank you and praise you for this great commission. Uh, Father, it's, it's, it's not the, it, it, it might seem like the great omission sometimes, but it is the great commission. Help us to invite uh, this teaching from your word, dear Jesus, this last mission you left for us before you left. Help us to be faithful and true to you, God. Give us a burden and a passion for those that we work with that are lost from Jesus or those that we know. You see the hands that were raised. You know the exact person or situation or um, people. You know exactly, Father. And so I pray for faith. I pray for anointing. I pray for power. In the name of Jesus, I pray for an unction, an unusual unction, where you give boldness and power and passion and love to share your word and your message. And I pray that first and foremost, the life that we live, the life of those hands raised to be a light in the dark place would become so vibrant and so real, so genuine and so true that they would be approached regarding the Jesus they travel with. We bless you. We praise you for your grace and love. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. So let me call up the elders. Let's have our communion this morning. Have our communion this morning. And as we get ready for communion, just keep your heart right. Keep your heart looking to Jesus. And... Um, ran out of cards, I'll bring more next week, okay? We'll bring more next week. As we get ready for communion, just if you can just bow your eyes there uh, once you receive the, the elements and talk to Jesus. Maybe there's something about the message he spoke to you about. Maybe it's a praise report of, of that person who impacted you and gave you a hunger for Jesus. That's a praise report. That's a testimony. Maybe it's something in your life that, that is keeping you from sharing the gospel. Maybe it's the need to want to be discipled so that you can, you can know how to approach someone and how to help them grow in their walk with God. We want to offer that this year. But just bring your heart to God. Thank Him for the cross. Thank Him for the blood of Jesus. And if you're here today and you're not a follower of Jesus, you've never made that right with Jesus, I do encourage you to abstain from communion. Jesus said this would be for those who follow him. But if you're here and you have not made that decision for Christ, today is a good day for that. He came and died for your sins as well. Even those online, I encourage you, make Jesus your Lord. That message is still being proclaimed today. And it's still changing lives. The Bible says that on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread. On that same night that he knew that he would be disowned by his disciples and his followers, he took bread. And that same night where Jesus felt all alone, he took bread. And after giving thanks, he broke it and said to the disciples, who he knew would desert him, this is my body, which is broken for you. Then he said, do this in remembrance of me. Let's partake together, please, of the bread.
Dear Heavenly Father, <clears throat> Lord, thank you, Lord, just for sending your Son as a sacrifice, Lord. Lord, uh, that was the punishment that, that we deserve, Lord. You, you took, Lord, that, that punishment for us, Lord. Your body was broken, Lord. And, Lord, as we, Lord, just uh, meditate on that and what that means, Lord, just help us to just have that better gratitude, Lord, of... Uh, thankfulness, Lord, for what you did there for us, Lord, on that cross. In Jesus' name, amen. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Jesus knew that his disciples would desert him, right? And he knew that they were sinners and that there was a separation gap between him and them after everything he did and taught them. They said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Then he said, drink it in remembrance of me. Let's remember Calvary as we partake. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for your blood on the cross. We thank you, Father, that this blood washed away our sins. This blood reestablished our relationship with you. This blood brought us into your presence. This blood gave us the opportunity to call you Abba, Father. Thank you, Lord, for your love for us. And help us to show our appreciation, our thankfulness for all you have done and continue to do in our lives. And I pray, Father, that this blood will remind us that you want us to go to a higher calling. You want us to be more like you each day. You want us to allow your love to shine through us and help us to do that. Help us to give you that praise and that worship with our lives. For you are worthy of that. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 We'll have our closing song and then we'll take a few moments if anyone has a testimony, he or she needs to share. Amen. Thank you. Would you all please stand as we sing our closing song?
your service and your worshiping with us. And I'm blessed to see my brother Jason. Thank you, brother, for playing that guitar for us. And brother Ryan, you're a blessing to us. Thank you for serving our king with your talents. And jazz. And absolutely. <laughs> Praise God. Um, yeah, I just want to know, let you know there is a brief meeting today for the ushers in the library uh, following our service today. And um, let's open the door for anybody you want to share. Well, I'm going to be first. And then, I, uh, then you, you can sit down, please. But um, I just wanted to say the two of them, uh, everybody's important to, to me. You know that. Um, you know that. But uh, two of the most important people in the world, uh, I just want to thank God for my wife. Uh, Dave, yesterday had a good time at our men's meeting. We had 11 men, Brother David Gray, and he challenged us on some thoughts from 1 Peter chapter 1, uh, uh, chapter 2. And uh, just um, on the role that the wife plays in our lives. Honey, I just want to thank you for everything you do. She's behind the scenes, but she does a lot, right? And then I want to thank God for my boy. Um, Jeremiah has, um, I mean, I'm probably going to say this for him. He'll probably follow it up, but he's made it. He's graduated from Moody Bible Institute. And he's, and, and he's waiting for God's next uh, steps following the orders of the Lord in his life. So thank you for your many prayers. And um, I just want to say these are two very, very special people in my life. And now coming alongside Jeremiah. Is Shally. So I thank God for all of you, but I needed to recognize my wife and my son. Anybody else want to share? Amen. Well, anybody else want to share? A couple of minutes here, something Jesus did, uh, a prayer request, a prayer thought, something he said today, something he's done, an impact he had in your life through someone who discipled you, anybody, anything? No preaching. I'm just kidding. I need to thank every single person in here who has lifted me up to the Lord in prayer over the course of the last four years. Um, God pointed me in the direction to go to Moody. Originally, I had no intention on going back to college, as some of you already know I had left Bloomsburg. I dropped out of Bloomsburg University to start being a corrections officer full time. Now, through my time as a corrections officer, the Lord really compelled me in regards to the current state of our nation, the current state of our prison system, which was the original passion that convicted me to leave working in the prison system and to go to Movie Bible Institute. Now, praise God, there are two Olivo generations that have graduated from Moody Bible Institute. That's an amazing accomplishment, and I'm so blessed to be able to share that with you. Now, to everybody here that is listening today, I would like to ask you again to continue to keep me in your prayers. Obviously, these prayers have worked, and I would not be in the position that I am today if it was not for all of your prayers. And I hope that you all know that in those times of spiritual warfare and those times in which the enemy was attacking me and, and lying to me, telling me that I was not going to be able to finish this, I felt your prayers in my spirit. Prayer works. And, and I want to say that from up here. So I'm asking you all to pray for me today because... The Lord has put conviction on my heart to get involved in the political sphere in our nation. The Lord has put a conviction on my heart as well as the heart of my fiance, future wife, Shally, who's sitting right there, that he has put it on my heart to move to West Virginia. We would like to move to West Virginia within the next 365 days. I don't think that that is... Uh, too hard to do as long as we are determined and fixed and focused on above. And of course, God has already confirmed this in all of me the same way he confirmed for me to go to Moody four years ago. Uh, if I'm being completely honest with all of you here, this is really the last thing that I would really be wanting to do now that I'm 25. 
I would love to just buy an RV and get a remote job and travel the beautiful United States with my love, but God has put a deeper conviction on my heart in regards to the state of our times in, in the United States. You know, I think a lot of the times the things that we speak about don't necessarily always fall into the political uh, field. For instance, uh, just a few weeks ago, Patty shared a beautiful message in regards to plan, uh, to your loving choices and in regard to the status of abortion here in the United States. See, this is something that has become a political issue, but it really is a spiritual issue. It is a issue with morality in our nation. So as morality and spirituality continue to decline across all of our 50 states, a lot of things that were once spiritual morality issues are going to find themselves in the political world. And I thank God for the ministry of your loving choices and for all of the men and women in the faith who have advocated for choice over the course of the last 30 years in this nation to the point in which we were able to get that repealed in the Supreme Court. Um, I'm not gonna sit here today and just talk about political matters. What I'm here to tell you is that I want to take the church to the political world. I think there is no bigger than a time like we are living in now in which the church needs to be fully represented within our political field. And that is what I am asking you all here to pray for me today with. Um, this is not something obviously that will happen tomorrow and it's not something that will happen even next year. But I know that the Lord is going to continue to work in me and continue to mold me for the will and the purpose that he has for my life. And I know that all of your collective prayer will help get me to there. So thank you, everybody. Amen. 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 Anybody else want to share before we close? Brother Paul, hold this. There comes that guy again. Caleb, we don't have time for another skit. <laughs> Can you imagine an honest politician? Would that be awesome? <laughs> Praise the Lord. <laughs> Amen. Amen. <clears throat> Dick Mapes has a camper. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah but you got you to gotta check with Shirley about yeah. that. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> I want to thank all the women for uh, blessing Trina yesterday. That was a, a lot of fun for her, and we got showered with a bunch of baby stuff. That was great. So you guys, all you women, thank you for all your work that you do, and yeah, you guys, uh, you guys are awesome. So, thank you. Amen. I, I, I can't wait till that little Jay is born. <laughs> Anybody else? We get ready to close in prayer. One more, two more. Just raise your hand. All right. I thank God for our, our, our deaf group brothers and sisters here today. They have a special food thing going on today. Wow. Yeah, if anything's left over, I live right on across the side here, right? All right, let's pray together. Father, we bless you. We praise you today for your grace and love. Thank you, God, for 
Uh, Jesus, Jesus, thank you. 2,000 years you've carried generation after generation, men, women, and children declaring Matthew 28, 19, and 20, God. Thank you, Jesus, that your work will get accomplished. You will fulfill the mission through your people. And thank you that in your mercy and grace, you've called us to be part of that mission. We're not worthy of it, but you're worthy that we do the best we can for Jesus. I pray for every man, woman, and child in this place. I pray for any online. Holy Spirit of God, in these trialsome days, make yourself more real. Put within our hearts, starting in mind, oh God, a heart to know you better, to draw closer, to experience Jesus, to be more than just a, um, a reader of the Bible, but someone who follows the Bible and lives for Christ. Help us to be a light, a lighthouse in this dark world, we pray. And we thank you for your love and grace. In Jesus' name, and all the people together say, Amen. Amen. Thank you.